But without further ado, um, I'll come back to some other bits and pieces later. But for now, I would like to introduce the first keynote presentation of the day. Uh, we're very happy to have three very special people here to deliver that talk. And it is the original Koha development team of 1999. So we have three people here. One is Rachel Hamilton Williams, um, the founder of Katipo Communications and the leader of the team who convinced the Hodafina Library we could write an open source system starting this whole fun thing. So Katipo Communications still hosts the Koha mailing lists um, and possibly a couple of Koha sites too and um, help people along the way to finding um, the resources they need in the community. So, um, we also have with us today Rosalie Blake. Welcome, Rosalie. Uh, Rosalie was with Horofenua Libraries from 1981 until 2009 when she retired. Um, at the time when um, Koha went live, Rosalie was the manager of the libraries. So, um, made some really important decisions that has affected thousands of us all over the world. Um, Rosalie served um, as the regional and national councillor for Lianza and was also heavily involved with the revamp of the Public Library Statistics and the 1995 edition of the Public Library Standards for New Zealand Libraries. And last of all, um, we have Chris Cormack, who um, many around the world, for whom many around the world that will be a familiar name. Um, Chris is a developer at Catalyst IT in the Koha team. He's a technical lead, and he is one of the original developers of the Koha open source library management system. He's also a passionate enthusiast of using open source and open data for the betterment of te iwi Māori and Aotearoa in general. Um, please join me in welcoming Rosalie, Rachel and Chris. That's up there already. Good morning. Tēnā koe katoa. Kia ora. Rachel indeed is a very persuasive speaker, but the Koha story goes back a little bit further, in fact 25 years, when a wise councillor at Horofenua District Council informed her fellow councillors that on average they spent two minutes a month talking and thinking about libraries. They were shamed, as well they should, should have been. But she was persuasive and she told them that perhaps a group of interested citizens might do better than 10 councillors who could only spare two minutes a month. She was persuasive, as I said, and so Koha was born. Uh, so the Horofenua Library Trust was born. She gave me five trustees who were business people from our community. And that's a key thing to remember. These are not just any fool who's climbed up the public service. These were wise business people who knew about things. And when they had a problem, they recognised it. We're going to move forward a couple of years. We've got to 1999, and the whole world was worrying about what the computers were going to do when we got to the year 2000. And it was all going to happen at midnight on the 31st of December 1999, for those of you who are still old enough to remember back that far. In New Zealand, we were equally worried. And in Horofenua Libraries, <coughs> excuse me, we had, <coughs> I can't remember what we had, let me look. Wrong page. We had an old system very old, quite shaky. Sounds so we strange, thought, yeah. this is back about July or August of 1999, maybe we need a new system for this new millennium that's coming. So we looked around and we found some splendid systems that were hideously expensive, not just to buy, but to run as well. There was no sort of low-key efficiency about connecting our branch libraries. Or there were systems we could afford and they were dreadful. They were mediocre and worse than what we had. Am I supposed... Are you clicking? I'm clicking. What's that? Look, it works. <laughs> I'm clicking. Sorry. Yes, she's, she's doing great. So bravely, we decided we would commission somebody to write a new library system that fitted 
our needs in Horofanua District Libraries. And when we'd done it, we would give it all away. Hello, what happened to the business heads of my trustees? Mm. But they went with it. And this in 1999 was when Windows was king. So why did we decide we could do it differently? Open source? Uh, what? We had the people to explain it to us, they convinced my trustees, and off we went. While some very big organisations in New Zealand, you may remember the police force, were spending millions of dollars doing the same thing, commissioning new software, and it never worked the way they wanted it. However, always optimistic, always convinced of our luck, we had the trust who were going to be wise and guide lightly. We had Katipol Communications, whom we knew and trusted because they'd been managing our, our library systems for years and years. They were trustworthy. And we had my staff, who knew how things worked and knew that they could explain it because they were smart people. I had employed most of them. <laughs> and we were all sure we could play our part and... In the beginning of January 2000, when we opened our libraries, the first part of Koha opened with us. Nice fireworks. <laughs> Great fireworks. Great fireworks. What do I do, Kate? So there we are. Thank you. Somebody else is taking over. Yep. Is that me now? That's you now, Chris. That's me a long time ago. I was um. <laughs> there will be a quiz later as to how many young Chris photos I've snuck in this presentation. <laughs> I knew my audience. Yeah. You're all going to just want to watch baby photos of Chris. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, I think if I hadn't been that young, I would never would have said that we could do it, I think. <laughs> um, the, the, the arrogance of youth, I guess. Um, so, yeah, there was a, a small group of us. Um, I never... Well, actually, the, the night of New Year's Eve, I was at Rachel and Simon's house and we were inside um, working because we hadn't finished it yet. <laughs> <laughs> and so we ran outside and we saw the fireworks um, from uh, Whareipoti. It's been renamed to Whareipoti Street, Whareipoti Street back, in the, back then. Um, ran kind of across what was Athletic Park uh, and saw the fireworks out there and then ran back inside and kept going <laughs> so, that, so that people could issue some books when the library opened. That was the bit that wasn't quite working yet. That's kind of a semi-important part of a library. <laughs> <laughs> you could catalogue them, you just couldn't give them to anyone. Um, so that was kind of what Koha looked like um, out of the box. Pretty neat for 99, 2000. And a lot of that, um, most of that was Rachel's work. Um, all the look, all the UX, all the f words that exist now that didn't back then, um, Rachel was doing them. Um, UI stuff, business analysis, um, project management. Um, I just typed, so um, Koha, Koha is pretty much the product of these two and the rest of the library staff. Um, I didn't know what, how a library worked from the inside, I knew how it worked from when I went to the library at university and tried to get a book out and things happened and they either gave me the book or they didn't and then they usually told me I'd pay them some money at some point. Um, so I used to work, go up to the library as much as I could. And, and be on the floor there and get a feel for how it is and watch people issuing and have a go at issuing books and then go back and sleep on someone's couch and write some code to try and, try and do that. Um, so it's agile before that was a thing as well. It was, we were, it was so agile that we had no process. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not quite agile. We, yeah. Dogma's not something we do. Um, so that was the acquisition. Screen. I still think it's better than the acquisition screen we have now, but that's just because um, we did it. Um, it's been changed a lot. Um, we understood that one. Yeah. <laughs> one, of the, one of the interesting things was because it was a trust, they got audited, so the acquisitions uh, had to be actually really um, tight. It had to be um, accountants would go through and check that what they said they'd spent actually tallied with all the other systems. So it was um, hard work, um, but we got there. Is that pretty much me? Yeah, no. that's Sweet. It. Cool. So, um, so we'd made this thing, and we'd convinced the Library Trust that they needed to be open source because 
despite the fact that they trusted us, we weren't sure we really trusted ourselves to be around for as long as their previous library system had been there. Um, and so we thought open source was definitely going to be their salvation from that point of view, that they were not going to end up left with this kind of orphan system that much like they had kind of had been, we were, they weren't going to end up with an orphan system if we could convince some other people to be interested in it, and the way to do that was to be open source. So, despite the fact that we spent a whole lot of time working out how you make a library system, turned out that was harder than it looked. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we then we actually put a lot of thought into how to make it so that all of you would want to be involved with our kind of crazy scheme. And so one of the things that you have to do when you make a new thing is you have to name it. We spent a lot of quality time in a coffee shop, I think, in Levin trying to decide what to call it. And we came up with Koha as a name. And that was for a bunch of really interesting reasons that played out, as it turned out, several years later. One of the reasons we liked Koha as a name was because it was quite unique, but it was, in our opinion, not lawyers though, untrademarkable. That it was a common enough word in New Zealand that Māori is an official language here. We, couldn't have, we could have called it the free library system, also untrademarkable, but we actually didn't want you to think it was free. We wanted to think that actually we kind of maybe wanted to start you out thinking it was free and then you would realise what a web of obligation you had in fact <laughs> wanted to. <laughs> and here we all are. Uh, yes, so the, the point about the name Koha, and I did spend an awful lot of time on, um, on mailing lists kind of gently explaining to people that it was pretty much the opposite of free and that uh, we were giving what we had and we would really love it if you would give what you had and that that was the... the uh, that was the meaning of the word, that it wasn't free at all and it wasn't a donation, that it was a web of obligation that where we all gave what we could. We were not asking you to give more than you could, but that we all gave what we could. And, um, and then we did all the regular things. So this is before Facebook and <laughs> social media. So we did regular media. So that was a picture of me at a computer, which was what people thought it was. <laughs> Um, <laughs> so that was fine. So we, we did a lot of explaining about what open source was and what a library system was. And I forgot my box. Forgot my box. We even made a box because yeah. people didn't understand that it was software. We would go to conferences and do a presentation on it. And people would come and go, but what is it really? And we discovered that if we made an actual box that looked like, a, like an Adobe box for software, they were like, oh, it's software. Yeah, you've pointed, good, spotted another one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and we did a couple other things that I think this one demonstrates, is we made sure that the Koha branding and imaging was quite different to the Katipo branding and imaging. So we wanted to make sure that if another, when another company wanted to pick up Koha and use it with their clients, that they weren't up for a whole lot of expensive rebranding of Koha. They could concentrate on, on that. And if they wanted to rebrand they could. We definitely made it you could do that. But that our marketing materials and our, um, our support materials for the companies was aimed to make it easy for those companies to get involved and that they wouldn't, the barriers to them getting involved was low as well. So it wasn't just that it should be pretty for the libraries, but that it needed to be attractive to the other companies. And I have to say, I was um, super, super pleased to see that one of the presentations yesterday was on marketing, because I think that um, marketing can be pretty hard, for, especially for the people who spend their time coding, and, and that sharing that support um, among the companies is something that I really wanted to, to build in to the Koha story and to the Koha product. And now, I think... Oh, it's on the picture. At the bottom, just down here. Here we go. Oh, yep. <laughs> so my prime marketing tip, I would say, actually, for conferences, that that orange in the back is a piece of fur. So it's a very cheap thing. It's a piece of fake fur. The number of people who will come to your stand to touch a furry thing, <laughs> <laughs> and it's like a little catnip spider web thing for, <laughs> for librarians and of course once they're touching your wall 
you, they kind of have to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> right. So now we're to here, I guess. which is you. Yeah, so um, amazingly other people wanted to use it as well, which was um, quite neat. So it wasn't, as you'd, as you'd expect, uh, when people are still working on it the, the night before it goes live, uh, it wasn't quite polished enough for us to kind of throw out to the world at that point. So we didn't actually release the first release of Koha for people to download until around about June. So it had been in production for a while. We'd tidied up all of the hard-coded things that you just do at the last minute so that um, every library wasn't issuing to the Levin branch. You know, so that <laughs> it doesn't matter where in the world you're issuing a book to Levin. Um, so we had to fix all those. We released it. And then within hours, yes. hours, people who were talking to us on the mailing list and it had been downloaded and within days other people were using it. Um, and so um, one of the first people was uh, Glenn Stewart who was somewhere in Michigan, somewhere in the Detroit area, some, in one of the uh, motor industries that no longer really exist there anymore. One of those, he never, would, he never told us which one, um, but he had downloaded it and used it to catalogue all the manuals of their cars for their engineers. So they'd never had an actual searchable catalogue. Um, another really interesting one early on was that someone had downloaded it to use in a video store, which is what we used to have in the olden days. Um, and in, in the olden days, you used to have to go to the store and look on the shelf and hope that that movie you wanted to see is there. Um, this allowed people, to, they put the OPAC essentially as the video store. You could reserve, like you do in the library or request, uh, an, a movie and go to the video store and it would be there waiting for you, which was revolutionary. <laughs> so pretty, pretty much we started Netflix as well. Um, <laughs> and, and then um, you can see... credit for that. Uh, <laughs> so this is a really neat little graph, and that's just a number of... This is just code contributions. This doesn't count all the... At, there's at least as many, if not more, who do uh, documentation, work on the bugs, tracker, uh, all sorts of others. But you can see it's a nice graph. It's not quite exponential, but it's a good upward thing. It hasn't tailed off. Um, we don't need to squash this graph. We'd like it to keep growing. It's, it's, it's not a squash. <laughs> exactly. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of the, the number of committers. So, uh, uh, and just from, yeah, some stats from last week. Um, and this was only when I ran it on Friday, whenever I ran it. So there's probably more. We'd already had 122 different patches. So patches are changes to the code. They can be tiny. They can be massive. Um, from 17 different people just in a week, uh, all around the world, and 290 of them of different patches, all those same patches were tested and, and signed off. And then, yeah, there's 15 different organisations, different companies, different libraries involved in those just in a week. And so in the six months kind of to date, there's been 1,442 patches for um, the next release of Koha, which is next month, which is amazing. Um, and of those, they've been pretty much you've got double the amount because every patch needs to be tested twice. Um, once by a sign-off person and then once by QA. So those numbers are usually double um, how many have done. And if you think a patch, you average it out, it's going to take someone somewhere between 2 to 16 hours on an individual patch, depending on kind of complexity. It works out to a lot of days of work um, and a massive amount. Um, there's a whole... Kokomo model of software development. We've done, it, we're up to like 600 years worth of development in, in 20 years, um, if you worked it out, um, if you were actually trying to all do it in a linear fashion. I think that's kind of me. Okay, you're done. Yep. Now we're Rosalie. A little snippet that Chris missed, after he released it in June, as he said, you could see... The, from the mail coming in that there is a time lag around the world and Koha was keeping ahead of it. You could just tell where people were coming from that they had discovered Koha. The world was ready for yeah. it. Look at all those lovely people and the lovely ones who made it here too. We've got Koha. It's rolling along nicely. What challenges can we give you We've got climate change. We've got huge forest fires in Brazil and Australia. 
We've got tornadoes and floods in places that have never had it before and in the wrong season. We've got heat waves. We've got melting ice sheets. Is the world going to be sustainable? Are libraries going to be sustainable? Well, how about starting with little things like turning off the lights, not only the lights in your library, but also the lights on all your screens, even the OPACs, or slightly bigger things, getting in double glazing. Insulation, solar panels, they're getting cheaper by the month. And how about carpet? When you need to buy a new carpet, please, for the sake of New Zealand's sheep farmers, <laughs> don't put in synthetic carpets. You remember, it winds up as teeny little dots of things in the bottom of the ocean, and it poisons the fish. Wool is dear. We make no apology for it, but you'll never find it in the bottom of the ocean. When you've finished walking on it, you can compost it. All good. Was that all I was going to I say? That's you. <laughs> Here you go. So I'll no, I, okay. I was going to talk about massive supplies. You're okay. lucky enough to get a new building to play oh, with. Building, yes. You Have you considered passive heating and cooling? Never having to put more electricity into it, and maybe even a green roof if your climate permits. Rachel. <laughs> Now I see actually we're uh, running a little closer to time than I thought, so are we okay? Yep. Um, so yeah, we thought there wasn't that much to say about the birth of Koha actually, that, that you probably already heard it. So uh, we thought we're going to a library conference, what we should really do is read a book. <laughs> so <laughs> in part of my other life, I work with Mandy Henk who wrote this book. And uh, in one of my classic pieces of convincing, so you have convinced Rosalie that we should talk about climate change and how to have a carbon neutral library. So that is what the rest of this is about, which is, um, is how, what are the things that, that we should go forward with to have carbon neutral libraries. And actually, I was going to say, you're halfway there in that one of the things that Mandy certainly recommends is that you all run Koha. <laughs> So you're going to do this one again? Is no? it? Uh, yes, yes I am. <laughs> what else can you do? Uh, Mandy kept saying, you need a strategy. Well, what's your strategy about transport in New Zealand? Worldwide, 14% of greenhouse emissions come from transport sources. In New Zealand, it's 19%. Why have we got... 40% more than everybody else. We could be smug here, of course, and say, oh, but we 80% of our electricity sources come from renewable sources, and they're clean. We have hydroelectricity and geothermal and solar and wind and maybe tide and who knows what next. But it remains a fact that we use massive tanker loads of petrochemicals and every time we pump it into our cars, it emits more carbon dioxide. What about a bike? Wellington City has a book bike. Does your library have a car? Is it electric? Could a bicycle do the same job? What can we do to encourage bikes? Some things are easy. Little parking spaces. E-charging for e-bikes? Hmm, not hard. Books in your public library. You've got books about mending bikes, of course, because bikes have been around for centuries, nearly. But have you got a book about, a new book, about put it, changing your bike from an ordinary bike to an e-bike? Aha. Uh -huh. And lastly... Your patrons who come by bus, would more of them take the bus if the bus stop was closer to the library? Maybe. Cool. Yes. Actually, in, in Johnsonville, they've done that. The bus stop is right outside the library. So it's yeah. perfect. It's right outside the library and the swimming pool and the mall. It's like right in the perfect place. So it's not super hard to do if someone thinks about it. Um, that's the hard bit. Um, so... The other thing to think about, and this is uh, really important in terms of 
not just libraries, but anywhere you're using IT. Is where are your servers? Uh, where are your um, servers physically located? Where are, are they in Australia? Are they burning um, coal-powered electricity? Are they in New Zealand and they're using um, hydro? Uh, those kind of things are really are simple things that you should factor into the equation of where you're buying your services from, who you're hosting with. What, what are the policies of the companies that you're using? Are they at least trying to offset some of the carbon, even though that's a bit of a um, doesn't really happen, but um, that if at least they say they are. Um, but yeah, where where the physically located is a big difference in terms of the power that they use and the power where the power is generated. Um, we're lucky in New Zealand, as Rosalie mentioned, that a, a good percentage of our power comes from renewable resource renewable sources. Um, so it makes sense to have your servers. Also, makes sense in terms of latency and stuff to have your servers closer to you than uh, in that cloud that you don't actually, um, that's overseas and is burning coal to power it. This one is a picture of, what I'd say this is a picture of a new uh, solar farm in India opened by the UN quite recently. That's kind of cool. I think that's by Bangalore maybe, by the mm. airport, yeah. Mm. I think they've been past it. Oh, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and so obviously one of the other things is we need to take care of our staff. So we need to look after our people, look after our patrons, look after each other. Um, and this was, yes, an absolute way to sneak another picture of Chris in, really. But also I'm going to mention the other two guys in this picture. So one of them over there is Simon with the dark glasses on. He, he probably is the, the big trust thing for Rosalie and how we came to do this at all. He was the person who was looking after the library systems for many years before, um, before we, we went on this particular crazy ride. And some of you might remember Russell Garlick in the middle there sporting another fine Koha t-shirt um, who for, for quite a number of years was another one of the key drivers of Koha in those kind of early 2000s, yeah. Right up till 2008. Yeah, and as good employers, we took them on boat trips occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think this one's me actually. Here we go. So one of the other things, continue to work together. So this would be f from, from us, the original team, to you, is continue to work together, continue to share your knowledge and your experience and to not make each other reinvent the wheel, that would be awesome. And this is a workshop at a Kohakon? Yeah, in yeah. Greece. In Greece, lovely. This one's you. And this time I'm talking to the librarians among you, not the developers, you're wonderful people and amazing and we love you to bits, but librarian, librarians are important too. What do you do in a library? You should think of the library as the living room of your town. You have parties there. This is Shannon Library having its Halloween party, for goodness. I don't know why we have a picture of this, but this is the sort of thing it's we Halloween do. Next week. We do all the time, and it's Halloween next week. Thank you, Rachel. In Navin Library, we've counted people, and one person in three comes in to borrow a book. So the next person you hear say, libraries are about borrowing books, aren't they? No, they're not. They're about all sorts of other things. They're about people who come in to vote. Last week, I swear, the other two who came in were coming in to vote in the library. They come in to use free computers. They come in to learn a craft. Wednesday morning is when you learn about crochet. You come in to renew your driver's licence. And some days, not today, you just come in because it's wet and windy outside and the bus isn't going to come for another 20 minutes. Last story. Many years ago, I employed a, a bright young girl as a student assistant. She had just migrated with her family from a Pacific island. One day, when I was looking, I noticed her mother lurking round the library's front door. And I said to my student, and I must admit, I can't remember her name, but I can still see her. Why don't you go down and, and greet your mother and bring her in? And she said, my mother is frightened of the library. 
I ask myself how many other people in my town were frightened of my library. It's not a good thought, but it's one worth carrying on with. Keep your libraries friendly. Keep friendly yourselves. Do good to each other. Our Prime Minister, be kind to each other too. Thank you. That's it. We thought we'd finish with a picture of you. <laughs>